I can make it even worse, you know? Yeah, and, wow. And crazy? Yeah. <laughs> Many of you know that I grow plants indoors, but a few years ago, I was able to join a community garden in my neighborhood to grow more food crops and native plants. Aside from my raised bed, an opportunity to plant an underutilized, shadier area of the garden presented itself, and I wanted to see that happen. My idea was to plant a wildlife food forest, but the garden managers had a concern as to whether the soil was toxic, especially considering it used to be an old building site. So before I did any planting, I took some samples to the Cornell Soil Health Lab to be evaluated. Kirsten? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Nice to see you too. This is Kirsten. She's the laboratory manager here at the Cornell Soil Health Lab and also a soil artist, which we'll get into in another episode. She helps manage and test all the soils that come into the lab, including mine. But as she shared with me, Cornell does their tests a little differently than other labs. We air dry our soil. These came in um, in the last couple days. We lay them out, we kind of break them up. They sit here for about two or three days before they're totally dry. Is there a reason why you air dry? Yes, we air dry to um, maintain the biological activity. Okay. So a lot of soil labs, if you were looking at just nutrients, mm -hmm. you would take your soil, you would sieve it, and then you would dry it in a 105C oven. Um, and that kind of like stops everything, and that's fine for looking at nutrients. But if you're trying to look at the life of the soil, we need to keep it alive. There's more organisms in a teaspoon of soil than there are people on the planet, right? It's, yeah. it's really an incredibly diverse and active ecosystem that we're just starting to understand, so. After the soil is air dried, it's divided and samples are sent to different labs at Cornell to assess whether there are any heavy metals or other toxins in the soil. Since this was my main concern, I wanted to see how my garden soil fared. You got an overall score of excellent. That's a really <laughs> good sign. We have this set up so it's easy to understand with the dark green being really good, light green is a little less good, and red is where we start to see issues. Mm. So, you know, overall you have dark green, so this is really good. Which is impressive because this is coming from an area that a building had been taken down, and sometimes urban soils are not really all that healthy. We do see um, generally a bit of like background heavy metals with urban soils, pretty much all urban soils. Uh, and sometimes we see some pretty scary high levels of heavy metals. We could start with your heavy metals. Yeah, that'd be great. And then where do these heavy metals usually come from? Uh, the heavy metals are usually coming from industry, right? Or lead yeah. um, came from, you know, we added lead to our gas for a very long time, I think even into the 80s, yeah. perhaps. Paints too, I guess. Paints yeah. coming off of buildings. You know, arsenic was used kind of like regularly as an insecticide a long time ago. So these are things that we didn't understand 30 years ago that now we're sort of paying the price for now. Yeah. yeah. But your heavy metals are all below the threshold. Oh, thank God. <laughs> and what's the threshold that you measure at? So this is the recommended maximum trace element concentrations for a garden soil. Yeah, okay. So really this chart is referring to uh, a soil that you would be eating out of. Mm -hmm. This isn't something that you'd be concerned about if it was just kind of like on the ground and you're not cultivating right. it and tilling it and stirring up that dust. I think you can completely feel comfortable um, with these results, you know, like especially lead would be really concerning, right? Especially right. With little kids, you know, eating soil, that's something that happens in community gardens but you're at 121 milligrams per kilogram and you know the toxicity level is 400. Wow, okay, so, so that's well really below. Well yeah. below. And like we do see a little bit, um, your arsenic mm -hmm. is pushing eight and the level of concern is 16. Mm -hmm. So that's the only one that's starting to like push it a little bit in my opinion, but it's not something you know, that you have to be concerned about at all. This is basically very typical for background heavy metal um, levels for any urban environment. Okay, and is it is it typical for a plant to take up arsenic? Like even though you have arsenic in the soil, for instance, or lead in the soil, does that plant actually take it up or does it depend on the type of plant, do you know? 
It depends on the type of plant. So certain types of plants, like hemp, for instance, takes up a lot of heavy metals. Mm. And some people are actually saying that that's a positive thing because you could use it to pull heavy metals out so of soil. Bioremediate the soil itself. Which and then, yeah. really interesting. And then perhaps if you're turning it into rope or something, there's really no harm there. Right, but if, if, if it's something that you eat, then that, that might be a concern. Definitely, so the number one thing to worry about with heavy metals is greens. Mm -hmm. So like lettuce or kale, right? How they have, like imagine like a dinosaur kale with all those little, right? So the um, dust will splash up when it rains mm -hmm. and get kind of caught in there and that's really hard to wash out. Right. Um, and then you would think about like root vegetables, things where it would be actually hard, like cabbage, you know what I mean? Things where it would be hard to, to wash that off. Right. Because like beets, yeah, when you're talking about root vegetables, like we do a cursory wash, but there's always like yeah. just a little soil left on it. Though my soil didn't have any heavy metals that could affect human health, Kirsten did notice some other elements in my soil that could be a cause for concern. What other things that did you find from the soil? Because I did see some red marks and orange marks, though. Yep. So. Okay, so the, the red mark is phosphorus, and the reason that we gave you um, a red rating is because your phosphorus is a little bit too high. And phosphorus is usually used as a, um, a fertilizer, in a way, for, for plants. So mm -hmm. how would the, the phosphorus be too high? Is it, is it that there's, you know, like too much fertilizer? Maybe that was in some of the soil amendment, or...? So um, this is 100% for environmental impact mm. that we give it this rating. Mm. So if you have phosphorus that's too high, then it's more likely to run off and into our waterways. Okay. And that's what causes some of those like anoxic zones and things like that. So that's the main concern. Um, my guess is you've been adding a lot of compost mm -hmm. and perhaps a lot of manure. Yeah. And that especially manure has really, really high levels of phosphorus. So I would recommend um, not adding phosphorus mm -hmm. fertilizer this year, mm -hmm. and then it'll probably um, even back out. You could always do another test um, after the season and even just test for phosphorus. We can do that here. Great. And you can see if you've gotten it down. Perfect. But it's not something that will affect your plants too much. Yeah, okay, that's really, that's really good to know. And then we also saw the only other orange was in the root pathogen pressure. So. Uh, the root pathogen pressure, we grow these beans that are highly susceptible to certain root pathogens like pythium. Mm -hmm. And then we took your soil and we planted those bean seeds in that soil and we grew them in our greenhouse for five weeks. Mm -hmm. And then after um, the course of five weeks, we harvest them, we wash them, and we rate them according to how much disease pressure we saw evidenced on the roots. So. You having a 5.3 means that we did see some pathogen pressure, but that's not really an incredibly high number. Mm -hmm. um, my guess is it might be a little wet there. Mm, yes, it is, yeah. There's not a tremendous amount of sun, so the soil ends up being a little bit more dank, if you will. You know, my suggestion on that would be to try to increase your drainage in some way. You know, you could even do some type of like a deep-rooted cover crop, like a tillage radish or mm -hmm. a daikon, mm -hmm. right? So a daikon radish, is, um, has this very, very long tap root, mm. so it busts down through any compaction layers, mm. and it'll increase your drainage. That would be a really natural way to approach it. Great. And um, along those same lines, I see that your soil respiration is just a little bit low. And here we're saying like it's not amazing because yeah. your results are basically amazing. Everything yeah. looks great here. But I feel like that probably goes along with that root pathogen pressure. Because so it feels like a little compacted maybe the soil, perhaps. Perhaps even like borderline anaerobic, mm -hmm. right? So that's going to hamper those beneficial microbes. Um, and that's what we're measuring with the soil respiration is the breadth of those microbes in your soil. So to see these go together, I'm glad that I was right and that yeah. it's, a, it's a wet area. That's yeah. pretty much what that tells me. But that's really a pretty easy fix. Yeah. You know, you just, you can incorporate more organic matter, perhaps, you know, not high phosphorus organic matter. And also like kind of trying to break through that drainage situation will probably, I mean, you might be able to turn this into an all dark green report in yeah. a year or two. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's an interesting that you could see so much and like know so much about our soils and kind of imagine what this like little plot of land could actually be like. In addition to measuring for levels of toxicity, phosphate, and root pathogen pressure, there are other tests to help give you a more complete picture of your soil health. 
Kirsten took me through some of the other tests that they run in the lab, including aggregate stability, to show what happens to a soil when it's been managed in two very different ways. I think the best way to think about aggregate stability is it's the ability of your soil to stay on the field where you want it to, right? So it's not running off if a, a, rain, a big rainstorm comes and all, the, all of a sudden all your topsoil is gone. Exactly, and the reason that a soil is uh, strong, has a strong aggregate stability, is because of the life of the soil and the organic matter in your soil. So you also had really high organic matter, so that's really good. It was, I think, around 8%, mm -hmm. which is great. So that tells me, and with your other test results, that that soil is quite stable, which is exactly what we want. So in this case, we're gonna look at these two soils. So this one is under sod, mm -hmm. um, basically just grass, and you can see the grass in here. Yeah. Yeah, feel free to touch it, and you can kind of see that it's um, a little dark. Yep. Right, so this has been under continuous grass for around 30 years. Wow, okay, so several decades really untouched, you know, under this grass. Exactly, and these little like chunks here, those are aggregates. Yeah. And these aggregates are held together by root and worm exudates, mm -hmm. which is basically the slime on yeah. the outside of an earthworm. I was gonna say, like, or like exudates, I was like, is it the poop or the slime? It's the slime. <laughs> okay. <Exactly. laughs> yeah. So that slime is a really, really important part of the life of the soil. Amazing, you know? Because it holds it together, right? Yeah, yeah worms, are, worms are very important. I can see right off the bat that this is very nice, very strong aggregates. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place it in this beaker of just water on top of this uh, sieve. Oh, and you can see some of it starting to come down little bits. Yep, there's a little bit coming out. You can yeah. see some uh, some gases or mm -hmm. some air so coming out. So there are air out. pockets in here, yeah. Yep, which is nice. It's kind of, that's between those aggregates. There's air, there's water. Yeah, so that's great because it, plant roots actually need air or else they get asphyxiated. So this just goes to show you that there's those air pockets in there for those plants to, in, in order to breathe, roots to breathe. Exactly. Okay, and then this soil, so right off the bat, I think you might be able to see the difference here. Yeah, super pale, it looks chalky to me. Right, exactly, look at the dust just like yeah. coming off on my fingers. So this soil has been under continuous management for 30 years. Mm. So this soil has been tilled multiple times a year, right, very dusty. Yeah. Um, and it's also been cultivated multiple times a year. Yeah, so tilling means that they're taking either a tiller or some other thing to like take up the bottom layers, put it on the top, which is a really common practice, I think, in, in agricultural circles here, and something that I think a lot of organic farmers are trying to tell people, no, that's not always that good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, tillage is, especially in organic systems, you kinda can't completely get away from tillage, so generally we recommend that people reduce tillage. So you wanna like go out on your field as little as possible, and you want to disturb the soil as little as possible. So the microbes kind of like to live where they live. There's surface microbes, there's deeper microbes, right? And when you take those deeper microbes and you flip them up to the top, they're, they're not happy. Yeah, it's like an earth, I can imagine it's like an earthquake happening and all of a sudden you're all over the place and your home got disturbed. Right, but it also really hurts the structure, mm -hmm. right? Because you are disturbing their natural home. So you can see what happens if we put this in here. Oh yeah, look at how much more is coming down compared to this. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Yeah. yeah. That is just a real telltale sign. Don't till your soil. <laughs> right, or do it as little as, as possible. Because yeah. it's basically, you know, if you imagine this is a, a flooding event, which we mm -hmm. have more and more of these mm -hmm. days, then pretty much this soil, most of it is gonna run away. Right. And these are literally 50 feet from each other. Wow. These two spots. Wow, so there's like, obviously, it's not like it's coming from a different part of the country or whatever, it's, it's literally side by side. Yeah, literally side by side. Same soil type, same slope, same everything, just management. Just different management practices. This is uh, incredible to see. Wow, Isn't that crazy? yeah. <laughs> and it, it looks like a, a, you know, one of those snow globes, but a dirty snow globe, and this one's still clean, the water's still clean, you know, and that, it just, even the ones that are falling down from here are probably still in aggregate for, form, because they're not making yeah, you're exactly right. Dirt. You can see how there's still stable aggregates even yep. there on the top of the water. Yep. And then you can see how this is turning into this very fine dust and it's gonna turn into this kind of like yep. slime at the bottom. And yeah, and if this is going into even a, a pond system or whatever, it's going to hide all the light and the clarity for like the fish or, you know, so you can imagine this happening in an actual environment. 
Exactly, and if there was nitrogen or phosphorus in excess in this sample, this is going directly into our waterways. Right, right. Over here, we have our uh, rainfall simulator. This looks like fun. And this is one of my favorite tests. Um, this was developed in our lab by uh, Bob Schindelbeck, who is the director of the Cornell Soil Health Lab, and Harold Van Ness, who oversees us and um, is an amazing soil scientist. I love this where it says burp the dripper before each aggregate stability. It just makes me think that you like put it over your shoulder and you burp it. <laughs> I'll show you how we burp it. Okay. <laughs> right, so we have DI water in here and then we have these little tubes that um, control the speed of the water coming out. Mm. And then we also have this tube that controls the pressure. So this tube can get moved up and down and we can um, rain more quickly or more slowly on the samples. Yeah, which is which is good to know because if you you want to break up those aggregates to see what how stable they are in certain amount of rain pressure or frequency or something. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So you could use this for research. So we have it set to rain at about six inches an hour, mm. which is an incredibly yeah. serious yeah. rainstorm, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So, but that's something that even when I started my career was like somewhat unheard of, and now happens quite regularly. Um, so it's actually pretty applicable to the real world. So, all right, so I'll start by burping the dripper, <clears throat> which is just pulling out this stopper. And that just released the pressure that had built up on top. Okay. <laughs> I know. And we call it the dripper. We have a lot of like shorthand for our various yeah. tests that we do in here. But this was a special thing designed for your lab or is this thing that, that existed before? We designed this and, and we actually make smaller versions of it and we sell them and send them all over the world wow. to measure infiltration. So I'm just gonna pull it around and I'm gonna pull out this stopper. And what this is gonna do is it's going to allow air to come in here, and then once it bubbles out, then that makes it so there's just this amount of pressure okay. underneath the, the tube. So we'll wait for that to get started. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. So it doesn't even seem that extreme, right? But no. that's a six inch wow. an hour. That's like something I wouldn't even, maybe even consider getting an umbrella for. <laughs> yeah, right? But if you were under it, you would get wet yeah, really fast. Yeah. You'll see what happens to the soil. So then we have a timer. We're gonna put the soil underneath this for exactly five minutes. Uh -huh. And over here, what I did is I took that exact same soil that yeah. we just looked at, yeah. and I spooned out um, one layer of the soil onto these sieves. Yeah. So this one here is the um, plow till. Mm -hmm. the, like, I can see the color difference already. Exactly, yeah. and then this is the high organic matter soil. So what we do is we just place them on top of these filters. So these filters um, are gonna catch any of the aggregates that fail. Mm -hmm. And then we're able to um, dry them and weigh them and quantify exactly how many fell apart. So of course, um, before I put these on here, I recorded the weights so I know how much soil is on top of them. And then I'm gonna grab this and put it under our dripper. I guess you could see how quickly it, it gets wet by just observing it now. All right, so here we're starting to see um, them, this one falling apart already. Did you yeah. see that slime? Oh my goodness, that was so quick. Right, so we're at 30 seconds. Yeah. Right, and we're already starting to see this fall apart. And that kind of slimy look, that can create a surface crust mm. on um, that will keep like the water from infiltrating down and then you'd have even worse runoff issues, wow. right, out in the field. But wow, you could still see the difference. I mean, look at these two over here. I mean, you have a couple little holes here and there, but you could still see that it's, it's aggregate, um, aggregated quite nicely. Yep, so we just hit five minutes, so we're gonna pull it out. Okay and we're gonna place it here. All right, and then we can see. <laughs> it's like night and day. <laughs> Seriously, Unbelievable. right? Unbelievable. And this is just management. Yeah. This is how important management and this is. is. And this is five minutes of rainwater, well, simulated rainwater, that would be six inches an hour, yeah. right? And, and this just goes to show you that because this is no-till for 30 years, 
It has a nice aggregate stability. There's not much soil that went through, yet this one within five minutes has been tilled over those last number of years and it just goes right through. So there's no stability in the soil. I know. After putting soil through the dripper, Kirsten wanted to share how to test for soil texture, which measures the percentage of sand, silt, and clay in the soil. Understanding your composition of these three items in your soil, which is known as the soil textural triangle, helps determine what plants may be best grown for your soil composition. Your texture matters a lot. Clay, for instance, holds nutrients. So a lot of people don't like to have a very clay soil, but you really want to have some clay in your soil. Right. And it holds nutrients, so it means that it's not really available to plants that as much. It depends. Okay. It can it can hold them very tight, or depending on how many nutrients they are, it could be holding them for later use mm. by the plants also. Right on. Right. But then there's also sand. So sand is something that's really, you know, it all depends on what you're growing, right? If you're growing potatoes, you want sand. Mm -hmm. If you're growing um, lots of root vegetables, you want sand. But if you're looking for, like, good fertility, and holding on to organic matter and most typical garden plants, you really don't want a sand soil. You're going to want more of a loam. Mm. Kirsten uses a very fine sieve that catches coarse and fine sand. Then she takes a known weight of soil and shakes it in a sodium hexametaphosphate solution, which is essentially like dish soap. And that helps to separate the sand, silt, and clay, which will ultimately give you a sense of what percentage of those you have in your soil. All right, so now we have our clean sand, and you can kind of see it, right? Yeah. Organic matter and sand won't go through the sieve. She'll decant the organic matter off the top of the sample. The sand will be put into a can for weighing and then dried in a 105 degrees Celsius oven overnight. But the silt and clay will wash through and be separated afterwards. This would sit for two hours, but earlier today I did run another texture so that you could see what happens. Yeah, you start to see that little fine line down there. Yep, so yep. that's the silt. Mm -hmm. And the clay is still here suspended in the water. And then she'll decant that. I can't help but think that you're probably like an expert coffee maker. <laughs> <laughs> I do love coffee a lot. <laughs> I'm just curious where my soil fell. Did you do texture on my soil? I did. We should, okay. we should look at it. Okay. Oh, you have a sandy loam. That's very good. Okay. okay, great. And it is hard. You said it's hard to change your kind of soil texture. But if you uh, say you have something that's maybe a little bit sandier or, or whatnot, if you start adding more soil amendments to it or like leaf litter or anything, will that eventually over time change it slightly? Well, you're adding a bunch of organic matter, so it will definitely change the way that it behaves. Okay. Right? But if you had, like, just a pure sand and you're trying to add organic matter, it's going to be kind of hard to get that to stay there. Right, right. But if you have something like a sandy loam, you have that loam aspect to it, that organic matter is going to be much more likely to want to stay where it is. So this tells me that we just have a really good opportunity here to be able to, to plant something that I think would be... Um, totally fine in order to be able to eat and also to, to plant. I mean, sandy loam is kind of what a lot of people want for, for, their, uh, for their garden. I agree. Yeah, I think that you're off to a great start. Your aggregate stability was really great, 73%, you know, so you probably won't get a crazy rainstorm like that, but <laughs> yeah. if you did, yeah. that little, that surface is going to be quite stable. And then I guess the, the two things that we just look out for is just maybe increasing the drainage so that there's better respiration and less root pathogen pressure. Yep. And then just um, going easy on anything that could have phosphorus and, um, and actually just like maybe coming back you know, next year and, and seeing how the phosphorus fares from one season to the next. Yeah, I think that that's a really good call. Soil is responsible for 99% of the food eaten in the world, hmm. yeah. right? something in that area. Yeah. It's, it's the kind of thing where people ask me about hydroponics a lot and things like that, and it's like, yeah, that's an awesome thing to do. It's a really good option, but we can't really replace soil as a way to feed our growing population. Yeah, and the great thing, you know, that we, we did a piece on hydroponics, and one of the points that they made is there's so much you can't grow with hydroponics. You know, mm. leafy greens totally makes sense, especially when they don't have a shelf life and you could actually produce them within a local area. But think about your root vegetables. You can't grow those hydroponically. You need soil for them to go down into the, the soil system. So there's a lot of things that you, you can't actually grow hydroponically. Mm -hmm. And grains. Yeah, and grains, yeah. Right. That's like what most of us eat. Yeah. 
you know, all the time, right? So rice and corn and all those things, there's no way we can grow that in a greenhouse in any kind of like realistic way. If you want to test your soil in the U.S., look for state-assisted universities or private labs. Refer to their website for specific instructions on how to gather a sample. Though I already took a soil sample, I'll demonstrate now how I did it so you can have a sense of what's involved. So because it's an 800 square foot area, it's really hard to get soil samples from every single portion of this. So I called Cornell University, which is one of our state-assisted universities, and they suggested taking soil samples as if you're drawing an M or a W. And at those points of the M or the W, that's where you actually dig the hole. So I'm gonna take perhaps a soil sample from right here. And basically you wanna go about six inches down, which is pretty much the length of this shovel. You can see, wow, I have like some nice earthworms in there. Yeah, look at that earthworm you're going to want to take a transect of the soil. And I have to say that this soil already by your eye looks pretty good, but I have been working this soil and we've been building this up and this has been fallow for a very long time. Fallow just means that it wasn't in use. It wasn't being tilled. And this white stuff that you could see in here is mycorrhizae, which is kind of like the roots of fungus, which is all this King Stropharia mushrooms here. You'll want to take a nice little vertical piece of six inches down and you would put this in a cleaned out bucket and you would take another soil sample all the way down there. So we'd, I'd show you as I'm drawing the M. So this is one point of the M. And again, I'm not gonna dig down here because I have things planted. I have a service berry and a lignin berry right here and some other roots, but I would go six inches down into this area and take another soil sample. And then as I'm drawing the M, I would come back up here and again, you wouldn't want to take any of this top layer. Wow, look at all that mycorrhizae. Because your roots are going to go down a little bit further. So that's why you're going about six to 10 inches down. And then you'd take another cup of this or a cup and a half of that. And you'd put that in the bucket. And you'd want to mix all of those soil samples together in that bucket. Put it in a plastic bag and then double plastic bag it. And that's how Cornell will take soil samples. Yeah, and the way that we do it is like with the spade instead of a push probe. Yeah. So back in the beginning of my career, I did a lot of soil sampling with a push probe and like it's kind of can be pretty hard on mm -hmm. you, your hands mm -hmm. and on your body, on your back. But with a spade, we just dig an eight inch deep hole yeah. and then we take a little slice. I know yes. you did it, a yeah, slice exactly of bread off the side. Yeah. Yeah. About six inches, you know, kind of with the same depth the whole way. Yeah. Mix those really well. And we do also recommend that you pick areas that are represent representative of your entire uh, field mm -hmm. or of your garden. So like if you have something wet and low or something that where the crops aren't doing that well, you would avoid that. Great, well this has been really helpful. Um, this makes me feel so much better about going back and actually doing some more plants. I already did some planting, okay. but it allows me to actually you know, say with confidence, at least back to a lot of the community managers and the folks there that if you want to eat something here, you can, actually. And yeah. so, so this is super helpful. Thank you so much for this. Thank you so much. So for people who want to dig a little bit more deeply into soil health, uh, Cornell has a lot of free resources, including this comprehensive assessment of soil health online, as well as this book, Building Soils for Better Crops. So if you want to be a little bit more proactive about the soils in your area and improving your soils, then you could get both of these. I'll put it in the description below. Let me know if you've tested your soils in the comments below. And if you learned something new from this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel or hit the notifications bell, as that will let you know when the next episode is uploaded. If you want to follow my daily journey, then be sure to tune into Instagram at Homestead Brooklyn and check out my latest project, 365 Days of Plants, which highlights one plant a day for the whole year. And if you're keen to dive deeper into understanding houseplants, then consider joining the Houseplant Masterclass, the first online audiovisual course on houseplant cultivation, care, maintenance, and more at houseplantmasterclass.com.